the rich this morning. Thanks, Matt. Hey, good morning. It's great to see you. Isn't it so warm in here? If you know the person really well sitting next to you, just take a really dark, uh, sharp intake of breath and turn around and just blow on them and just call them down for a minute. <laughs> wow, how warm is it? Turn with me, if you've got your Bible, to Numbers chapter 13. We're going to read some verses together in, in a moment. Just while you're turning there, if I can ask you to remember someone in our family just had news passed to me that uh, um, Tina Grant, some of you will know Tina. Tina's mom passed away last evening, so if you can remember Tina and Colin and all the family, obviously just going through that time of bereavement right now, if you can really remember them in your prayers as well. But Numbers... Chapter 13, we're kicking off a brand new four-part sermon series that we start in this morning that we call in simply Different. Everyone say different. <laughs> different, with a little tagline, because who wants to be ordinary? And what we're going to be doing is, is taking a look at, at, at four people, four real people who lived a number of years ago, who we read about in the Bible, who lived and thought, and who acted and responded differently to the other people who were around them when they came up against certain situations. And who, because of that, not only made a difference in their day and generation, but who have continued thousands of years down the line, continued to inspire and encourage other people to be and do the same. And so to get us going this morning, I'm really going to try and work my way through this because I don't want to keep us here unnecessarily long, uh, longer than we have to. We're going to have a look at someone who I think is certainly one of the lesser mentioned heroes in the Old Testament. You could say within the whole of the Bible. And yet he was someone who, along with Joshua, was the only person from a whole generation of Israelites to make it through and enter into the Promised Land. That person, of course, being Caleb. Caleb. So let's read some verses together and then we'll get into the message. Numbers chapter 13. I'm going to flip through. A number of these verses here, reading from the NLT, picking up from verse 1. The Lord now said to Moses, send out men to explore the land of Canaan, the land I'm giving to the Israelites. Send one leader from each of the 12 ancestral tribes. And so Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He sent out 12 men, all tribal leaders of Israel, from their camp in the wilderness of Paran. Moving forward to verse 17. Moses gave the men these instructions as he sent them out to explore the land. Go north through the Negev into the hill country. See what the land is like and find out whether the people living there are strong or weak, few or many. See what kind of land they live in. Is it good or bad? Do the towns have walls or are they unprotected like open camps? Is the soil fertile or poor? Are there many trees? Do your best to bring back samples of the crops that you see. And so they went up and explored the land from the wilderness of Zin as far as Rehob near Lebo Hamath. Moving down to verse 23. When they came to the valley of Eshkol, they cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes, so large that it took two of them to carry it on a pole between them. How many of you know you don't get grapes like that at Tesco's or Aldi? <laughs> All the Waitrose shoppers are thinking we get them. <laughs> <laughs> they also brought back samples of the pomegranates and figs. That place was called the Valley of Eshkol, which means cluster, because of the cluster of grapes the Israelite men cut there. And after exploring the land for 40 days, the men returned to Moses, Aaron, and the whole community of Israel at Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran. And they reported to the whole community what they'd seen and showed them, and showed them the fruit that they'd taken from the land. This was their report to Moses. We entered the land you sent us to explore. And it's indeed a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here's the kind of fruit it produces. But the people living there are powerful, and their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. The Amalekites live in the Negev, and the Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites, and Elamites live in the country. The Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and along the Jordan Valley. But Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let's go at once to take the land, he said. We can certainly conquer it. But the other men who'd explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. They're stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites. The land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone 
who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. And next to them, we felt like grasshoppers. And that's what they thought too. Different. I wonder how many of you have ever been in a situation where you're having a conversation with someone, but you know from the things that are being said that for some reason you're both not quite on the same level or the same wavelength, where it seems that you're both referring to two completely different things. Has that ever happened to anyone? Let me try and illustrate what I mean. The the story is told of a lady who was rather old-fashioned, always quite delicate and elegant, especially in her language. She and her husband were planning a week's vacation in Florida, so she wrote to a particular campground asking for a reservation. And she wanted to make sure the campground was fully equipped, but didn't quite know how to ask about the toilet facilities. She just couldn't bring herself to write the word toilet in a letter. And so after much deliberation, she finally came up with the old-fashioned term, bathroom commode. But when she wrote that down, she still thought that was being too forward. So she started all over again, rewrote the entire letter, referring to the bathroom commode merely as the BC. Does the campground have its own BC? Is what she actually wrote. Well, the campground owner got this letter. He wasn't as old-fashioned as this person. And so when he got it, he just couldn't figure out what she meant by the letters BC. It really stumped him. And after worrying about it for a while, he showed the letter to several of the campers and people on his team, but they couldn't guess what the lady meant also. And so the campground owner finally came to the conclusion that there's only one thing she can be talking about, and that must be the local Baptist church. (laughs) And so he sat down, and then he wrote the following reply. Dear madam, I regret very much the delay in answering your letter. But I now take pleasure in informing you that a BC is located nine miles north of the campground (laughs) and is capable of seating 250 people at one time. I admit it's quite a distance away if you're in the habit of going regularly. But no doubt you'll be pleased to know that a great number of people take their lunches along and make a day of it. They usually arrive early and stay late. It's such a beautiful facility and the acoustics are just as marvellous. The last time my wife and I went was six years ago. And it was so crowded, we had to stand up the whole time we were there. It may interest you to know that right now a supper is being planned to raise more money to buy more seats. And they're going to hold it in the basement of the BC. I'd like to say it pains me very much not to be able to go more regularly. But it surely is no lack of desire on my part. As we grow old, it seems to be more of an effort, particularly in cold weather. If you do decide to come down to, that, to our campground, perhaps I could go with you for the first time. <laughs> Sit with you and introduce you to all the other folks. Remember, this is a friendly community. Yours sincerely, the campground owner. Great little story, isn't it? But isn't it funny how people can misinterpret things, how they can be looking at the same situation but see things differently? And I think we've got something like that taking place here in this story where we've got different understandings taking place over the same situation. Because on one hand, we've got the report from ten of the spies that went out. And on the other, we've got Joshua and Caleb's report. Exactly the same situation. And yet, some saw it one way, and the others saw it another. And as we look at this passage together this morning, along with maybe a couple of others that will come into as well, I want to pick out just a few things, them, and particularly from, from Caleb's story, that I hope will really just provoke your thinking a little bit this morning, but also be of encouragement to you. You know, the Bible doesn't give us all that much information about Caleb. Certainly, we don't have the same amount of information that we do of Joshua, who we know was the other spy who went with him, who believed the good report that the land was there for the taking. But from the little bits that we do have within Scripture, I think we can build something of a picture to establish what kind of person Caleb was that will encourage us in our walk today. Because the truth of us, all of us have giants to face, don't we, at various times in our lives. Talk to me. We all have giants to face. We all find ourselves at various times in situations where we've got to make a decision whether we're going to believe God 
and stand up for him and what we believe, even if that makes us unpopular with those people around us. And that's not always easy, is it? I don't think so anyway. The very fact that you've chosen to follow Jesus sets you apart as being different to the majority of people around you. You could think about your workplace, perhaps, or your neighborhood, the street where you live. How many other Christians, what we understand by the term Christians, are there with you? You're probably one of a handful of them, if at all. So that puts you in the minority. It sets you apart as being different. But then, like we're saying in this, who wants to be ordinary? Who wants to be like everybody else? You see, we spend so much of our time, don't we, trying to fit in. But I think God is actually calling us to stand out, to be different. So what do we know about this man called Caleb? Well, we know that he was part of Israel when they left Egypt under, under the Exodus, under Moses, which meant that he'd have been there when God parted the Red Sea. He'd have been around when all the plagues were taking place beforehand leading up to that Exodus. And so we know that he was someone who saw God's power at work in the most amazing ways. I mean, ten plagues... And the parting of the Red Sea, they don't come much bigger than that, do they? And so Caleb would have been there when these things were taking place. And so these things, I think, undoubtedly must have been key factors in him resolving deep within his heart that Yahweh was the true God. That he was the only and the almighty God, the all-powerful one, someone to whom nothing or no one could compare. Even the mighty hand of Pharaoh himself it's just a shame that way of thinking wasn't true for everyone else. Because if it was, then they'd never have ended up missing out on all that God had for them. That whole generation, apart from just two men, died out in the wilderness. How sad is that? Now, we haven't had the privilege of experiencing what Caleb experienced. Has anyone seen mighty plagues just come? Anyone got faith enough to believe the marine lake can just part now? But, you know, I believe this is the, the same kind of place that God disease each one of us who confess to be his followers get to in our lives. When we arrive at this place where we know, not here, not just in our heads, but deep down in our hearts where it really, really matters that he really is God Almighty and the things that we read about in the scriptures and the promises that he makes in there are just as relevant for you and me today as they were for those men and women back then when they first took place where he is the one through whom our lives function and really find their truest and deepest meaning. You see, Caleb wasn't just a believer. You see, I'm hoping that all of us this morning can say that we believe in God. But you know, even the demons believe, the Bible tells us. So that doesn't really set us apart, does it? You see, I think the acid test is when we have to, to use a common phrase, put our money where our mouth is. And act upon what God has said to us because to do that requires a much more intimate walk and requires us to step out in faith when naturally speaking, it doesn't, things don't seem to be working or going in our favor. Who knows what I'm talking about when I say that? And I think Caleb had something of this, this attitude within his heart. And the reason I say it is because six times we read in these scriptures and some of the passages that we're going to read that Caleb wholly or fully followed the Lord. That's a phrase that simply means to close the gap. In other words, it tells us that he was someone who was committed to keeping his distance between, the distance between himself and the Lord at an absolute minimum. And so every inch, every ounce, every nerve and fiber of his being, I think, belonged to God. He kept short accounts when he got things wrong. He brought it straight to him so that there was nothing that was getting in the way between him and his relationship with God and he included God in everything that he did I love this quote the man who kneels before God can stand before anybody I love that the man who kneels before God or the person the man the woman who kneels before God can stand before anybody or anything and I think that in Caleb we see that to be true and because of this as I said before, he trusted God enough to act upon his word to him. Hence his desire to go in and take hold and take possession of the land that he knew was his and the people of Israel's. 
Now, the reason I'm saying all this is because this was the foundation from which everything else that I want to share with you over these next few minutes could happen. Because it seems that this was something consistent in his life because 45 years later, okay, 45 years later, that's almost my lifetime, and a couple of years later, after Israel finally did enter into the promised land under the leadership of Joshua, Caleb now comes to Joshua, his new leader, and tells him it's time for him to claim his inheritance that was promised him long ago. You don't have to turn there with me. Let me read some, some verses. Joshua 14, verses 6 to 14. Now the people of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal and Caleb. So here he is, Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me? So he's referring back to this time when they went out to first spy the land. He said, I was 40 years old at that time when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to check out the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my fellow Israelites made up, my fellow Israelites who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt in fear by their bad report. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever because you've followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he's kept me alive 45 years since the time he said this to Moses while Israel moved about in the wilderness. Listen to this. So here I am today, 85 years old. I'm still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised to me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified. But with the Lord helping me, I'll drive them out just as he said. And then Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. And so Hebron has belonged to Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kezanite, ever since because he followed the Lord God of Israel wholeheartedly. And then the next chapter here from what we've read, Numbers 14, verse 24. We read what I think is a key verse to this man's success and one that links these two passages together. And it reads this, My servant Caleb has a different spirit. My servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly. I want to ask you the question just over these next few minutes. What does it mean to have a different spirit? What does it mean to have a different spirit? I think these verses give us some, some help in this. I've got four things. I'm going to try and rush through as quick as I can. Okay, if you're taking notes, you might want to write these down. What does it mean to have a different spirit? The first thing is this. I think it means that it's not just how you start that matters, but how you finish too. It's not just how you start that matters, but how you finish too. You see, finishing well is just as important as starting well. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of a guy called John Aquari. He's dubbed as Tanzania's most inspirational athlete. 1968, four athletes were sent on the long journey from East Africa to Mexico City in pursuit of Tanzania's first Olympic medal. And while none of them returned with a medal, the name of one man, John Stephen Aquari, returned and he endures to this day as a source of inspiration to countless athletes and fans, not only in his country, but around the world. I mean, 50 years on, and I'm talking about his story today. And the reason is because of this. Because despite hailing from the region around Mount Kilimanjaro, this long-distance runner, John Aquari, wasn't used to training in the types of conditions that he experienced when he arrived at high altitude in Mexico City. And while world records tumbled in the sprint races, as they often do in those kind of climates, the field that lined up for the marathon faced a formidable challenge. And so a quarry was on something of a back foot right from the beginning because he hadn't fully acclimatized to this. But then as he began running the race, he began suffering from cramp early in because of this high altitude. But determined to improve his position, he pressed in, but then he got involved in a pilot with other athletes nearing the halfway point of the race, causing him to suffer, listen to this, a badly gashed and dislocated right knee. 
as well as a bruised shoulder. It's not even halfway point. The marathon's 26 miles, so we know he's got at least another 13 miles to run with a dislocated right knee. How many of you would have liked to have given up at that moment? And he was being advised by all the people to pull out of the race. In fact, 18 of the 75 athletes who started the race would fail to complete it. But because of courage and pride, in spite of the intense pain that he was suffering, and after receiving a bit of medical treatment and a bandage for his knee, he continued on with the race to finish what he'd started. And while the Ethiopian runner, Mamo Waldi, uh, more comfortable with the altitude than most, was crossing the finish line to claim the gold medal, the quarry was laboring in a distant last place, but his never say die spirit remained. And as darkness fell, and most of the crowd had left the stadium, a lone figure embarked on the final 800 meters of his journey just to do two laps around the track. Television crews rushed back to their spots to capture the moment that a quarry limped over the finish line over an hour after the, the previous guy that I mentioned before had won the race. And when asked why he persevered in such punishing circumstances, he uttered one of the most memorable and inspirational lines in the history of the games. This is what he said. He said, my country didn't send me 5,000 miles to start the race. They sent me to finish. Wow. My country didn't send me to start the race. They sent me to finish. And while he didn't take any medal back to his home country, he did return with an incredible story of bravery and that Olympic spirit within him earned him not only the respect and admiration of his peers, but also a lasting place in Olympic history. He was different. He was different. Where others gave up, he pressed on and pressed in. And I want to suggest to you this morning that having a different spirit means that you don't just start well, but you finish well too. Paul said, I've, I've fought the good fight, I've finished the race, I've kept the faith. Now there lays in store for me that crown of splendor that the Lord will award to me on that day. You see, it's easy to start something, isn't it? Anyone can start something. But not everyone sees it through to the finish line, to completion. And that can be for all kinds of reasons, some genuine, some not so genuine, because things get hard or painful, obstacles come along the way. And we've all faced that kind of stuff. But it's so easy at those times, isn't it, just to give up. And you see it across all walks of life. Difficulties come. Business, sport, relationships, even in church life. We want it easy. And when the hard times come, we think, do you know what, this is too painful I'm going to give up. I'm going to walk away. I don't know about you, but I want to be someone who finishes well. I want to be someone who finishes what I start. I don't want to be someone who quits halfway through. I want to be different. And Caleb, it seems, was someone who not only started well, but he was a person who finished well. You could argue he finished even stronger than when he started. You see, so often the longer you work at something, the pace reduces over time doesn't speed up, but not so with this man. Even at 85 years old, he's still going full on for God. How many people have we got here this morning, 85 years or older? I know there's one or two. <laughs> Matt mentioned that work night tomorrow. We've got holes in the car park that need filling up. Are you up for that, Isabel? <laughs> Ron? <laughs> 45 years ago, God promised Caleb a piece of land, and now he's seen the fulfillment of it. And yeah, it took a long time for it to happen. There were a lot of battles for him to still go through in order to take hold of that land. But in the end, God saw it through to completion. Aren't you glad that we serve a God who always finishes that which he starts? Being confident of this, Paul writes to the church in Philippi, that he who began a good work in you will what? He will carry on to completion. He always finishes that which he starts. And I think it just makes it so much easier when we partner ourselves with him and say, God, I know this is difficult, but I'm trusting in you because you always finish that which you start. And I don't know what he might have started in your life that you haven't seen the fulfillment of yet. But I want to encourage you this morning, continue to hold on to those dreams. If God's promised it to you, he will bring it through to completion. Don't let them go. Keep believing that day is still to come. So it's not just how you start that matters, but how you finish. 
something else. Being a person with a different spirit. You never let age restrict you from God using you. Really flows in from what I've just been saying. I hope you know that already. <laughs> One person. But it's true, isn't it? See, the Bible tells us God's no respecter of people. It doesn't matter to him whether you're eight years old, like King Josiah, or 85 years old here, like Caleb. Age is no issue for God. I love his attitude. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now, now, as I was then. What an attitude. That's a pretty good age to still be taking on giants in your life, isn't it? I hope that when I'm, if I'm still around at that age, I'll have that same kind of resolve in me. See, I think there's a lie that pervades our society that says the older we get, the less useful we become. That somehow we don't have anything to offer anymore or we lose that ability to make that contribution. You hear it by the jokes that people say, don't they? You know you're getting old when you sit in a rocking chair and you can't get it going. Or when you sink your teeth into a steak and they stay there. <laughs> I could go on, but I won't. I just want to remind you this morning, you know, retirement doesn't exist in God's kingdom. You might get a golden handshake from your company that you've been working for, and that's great, and that's well deserved. But you know, in God's kingdom, there is no retirement plan. Age might inhibit you from doing some things physically, even legally. But if you belong to Jesus, you should never stop serving. The scripture's full of examples where this is the case. I don't have time to go into them. But you know, if, if we as a local church are ever going to see our reach and influence extended here in this town, which is what we're committed to, if we're going to see multitudes of people come to faith in Jesus who don't yet know him. You've heard me say it many times before. I'll always keep on saying it. It's going to need every one of us to get involved in some way, shape or form. Don't let age restrict you. Number three, what does it mean to be a person of a different spirit? It means that when you're facing a tough situation, you remind yourself that you have a big God. I don't know about you, but whenever I read the scriptures and I read the stories like this one that we've read this morning, I try and put myself just for a few moments in the shoes of the people who I'm reading about. And as I do that, I ask myself the question. Don't always do it, but I try when I can to ask myself the question, what would I have done in that situation? What would my response have been if I was, in, if I was one of them 12 spies, for example, that went out to check out the land? And of course, the difficulty that we have is that we know the stories so well and we know how they end. And so we almost convince ourselves, I do anyway, that I'd have been the third one, along with Joshua and Caleb, that ought to have been there screaming out, come on guys, we can do this. I guess the reality is, and I just don't want to own up to it, I could very easily be, have been more like one of the ten that said, it's too big, it's too difficult. Does anyone else think like that? If you were there, what, being honest, what would you have done? A university professor wrote this on a blackboard during one of his classes. What do you see? Just shout out quickly what you see. God is? God is nowhere. How many of you see God is nowhere? Because a lot of people just said in his class, God is nowhere. But then he let them look at it again. And just to, to look at it a little bit longer. And then they came out with this, God is now here. God is now here. You see, it depends on what you're looking for as to what you see. And let's be honest, when you're in the midst of conflict and struggles, it's so easy to see the first bit, isn't it? God, where are you in all of this? Hello? Don't put your hands up. I'll be honest this morning. It's hard to see God at times, isn't it? God, where are you? I can't hear you. I can't see you. It's difficult to hear what he's saying to you. And he often gets drowned out by the enormity of the situation. But you know, it's times like this that we need to stop and just take stock of the situation and remind ourselves 
that even though this is a mammoth mountain that we're finding ourselves up against, that we have a bigger God with us. That it's not a case of God is nowhere. We have to remind ourselves God is now here and stand on the promises of his word to us. And it's interesting to see how people react when they're going through difficulties because it's either one of those two. And I think sometimes God allows us to go through those times just so we can see what we're really made of within. Because he knows already. It's not so God can see. It's so that we can see, isn't it? And hopefully we can see how we've grown and how we, we trust in him. And we see those two reactions in this story. The majority wanted to turn and run. It's God is nowhere. But there were two of them, the minority, that said, no, God is here. Let's do it. We can take them. See, Caleb saw all that the others couldn't see. He and Joshua had witnessed exactly the same. And yes, what the other people were saying, true, there were giants there, literally giants. They were really tall. The walls were fortified, etc. And so what they said was true, but they'd lost all sense of perspective. But Caleb, he comes at it. He's a man of a different spirit. He looks at things differently. He looks at the situations through the eyes of God, not through the eyes of man. And he knew that no matter how big these people were, that God was always bigger. Where others saw giants, he saw God. Where others saw cities walled up to heaven, he saw cities reduced to rubble. Where others saw foes, he saw fruit, the fruit of the land. Same situation, but completely different response he chose to keep his eyes fixed on God not on the difficulty or the enormity of the situation before him what is it the Hebrew writer tells us to do let us fix our eyes on Jesus. on who Jesus. the author and perfecter I want to encourage you this morning and I don't know what the situation might be that you're up against right now but I just want to remind you you have a big God you have a, a huge God doesn't matter what that might be. It's sickness, a financial thing, a relational thing. Your God is bigger. I don't say that glibly. I'm just a throwaway, but it's the truth. And this is where as the people of God, we either have to stand upon the word of God or we think, do you know what? I'm just going to just go along like everyone else. But I don't want to be like that. I want to be someone who's different. <coughs> now to him who is able to do what? abundantly above all that we can ask, imagine, or think. Do you believe that this morning? I wonder if the band can come back and join me, because I've just got one more thing. And again, it just flows in from what I've said. Someone of a different spirit recognizes that there's going to be times where you find yourself in the minority. Because when you're standing up for truth, when you're standing up for the things that you believe in, that means there's a good chance that you're going to find yourself standing on your own. And there's no one else around you in those moments. I'm sure you've probably discovered that already. If you haven't, then maybe people don't know yet that you're a Christian. It's time for you to come out. Now, this isn't an easy thing to do. I know that from my own experience. But how can we ever hope to influence others? Or make an impact on the lives of others. If we're not taking stands at various times for the things and the one who we believe in. The truth is we can't. So I said that, I gave that quote before. Those who kneel before God can stand before anyone. But those who stand for nothing fall for anything. And you see it time and time again throughout scripture. But Caleb was prepared to take his stand. He was prepared to find himself in the minority. Because he was a man of a different spirit. See, the truth is you can't do it on your own. Or in your own strength. If you can, there's no need for God. But when we think about our, our mission, our vision here at Lakeside, and that is to, to reach our town with the message of God's love, to reach those people, those giants, maybe that you're finding yourself up against at work or in your neighborhood, maybe even within your family. You need God's help. And we need to learn to become more and more people like Caleb 
of a different spirit. But my servant Caleb has a different spirit within him. We read. And he's followed me wholeheartedly. Would you bow your heads with me? There's more I could say, but for the sake of time. Just close your eyes for a moment. Father, may everything that shared over these last 30 minutes or so be true for each one of us here today. That we might be people of a different spirit. That we might know and see your power at work in our lives. That we might be a people who increasingly trust in your goodness and your amazing love for us. Lord, I ask that you help us never to let the values of this world become the things that direct the way we live our lives out before you and before one another. And from the youngest to the oldest here today, and those who aren't with us this morning, may we know and discover more and more the plans and purposes that you have for us both individually and corporately together. Lord, will you help us always to remember that you are so much bigger than any in every situation that we find ourselves up against. And that you're always at work behind the scenes in our lives, even when we struggle to see that. But Lord, it's not a case of God is nowhere, but God is now here, that 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 would remain true for each and every one of us. Lord, help us to be a people who not only start well, but who finish well and fulfill every one of the plans and purposes and the promises that you have and that you've spoken over our lives. Lord, would you allow faith and not fear to be the thing that guides us and leads us and directs us? Lord, that we would stand out more and more as being different, not weird, but just not ordinary in the sense that, just like the status quo, but Lord, you begin to put a mark upon us and cause us to stand out and to take a stand for you. In the name of Jesus, I ask this. Amen. Just keep your eyes closed for one moment. I wonder if you're here this morning, you've heard this and you're thinking, I, I need that. I need to know this, this God that you're talking about in my life. You're here and you've never confessed your, your need of a saviour. You've never asked Jesus to forgive you of the things that you've done wrong and to give you a new start, and to come and live in you, to be a person like Caleb, we've heard about this morning. Just while every head's bowed, every eye's closed, just want to give you that chance to respond. Is there anyone here today that would say, I want this. I want Jesus in my life. I want to learn what it is to be a person of a different spirit. If that's you here today, would you do something for me really quickly? Just raise your hand so I can see it, and then you can put it down again. You're saying, I want to become a Christian. God bless you. Is there anyone else? Just put it up in case I haven't seen it this morning. Just put it right up. Okay, Father, we want to say thank you to you this morning for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Lord, as we step into this week, Lord God, would you you fill us, would you help us, would you guide and lead us into all truth and every good thing you have for it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Going to enjoy some drinks. In a few moments, let's uh, sing this song and uh, have a great afternoon. The Lord bless you. You'd like to stand with us?